Welcome to Spine Academy. In this video, we're going to discuss the posterior cervical foraminotomy. This is an excerpt from a broader course in which we provide a high-level overview of the different types of cervical spine surgery performed today. If you're interested in seeing the full course, we've left a link in the description. The posterior cervical foraminotomy is a procedure that used to be incredibly popular uh, that's really kind of fallen out of favor, but it's still a valuable tool in the armamentarium of most spine surgeons, and I'd like to spend a few minutes explaining what it is and then when I consider using it. So before we get into the specifics of when we use it, let's talk about what it is. If you imagine looking at the cervical spine in a single slice like this and look at an image that looks like this, you can see that in this person there's a disc herniation which is just off the midline, maybe midline or paramedian. It's causing pressure on the spinal cord, a little bit of pressure on the spinal nerve here. And, and this type of pathology may present with some spinal cord dysfunction or myelopathy or spinal nerve dysfunction. This is the type of disc herniation that we see in the setting of spondylosis that really for the most part you treat from the front because this pathology is right in front of the spinal cord. Now, as people's cervical spine ages and they develop spondylosis, disc herniations are one manifestation, but you can have midline herniations like this. You can also have herniations that look a little bit more like this picture, where you can see you have a herniation that's way off on the side here. It still causes some pressure on the spinal cord, and the adjacent spinal nerve here, as you can see here, and it's a fairly large soft disc extrusion or herniation here. Now, one important landmark we talk about is the apex, which is to say the tallest part of it. And the tallest part of this disc herniation is just outside or just lateral to the spinal cord. Now, when pathology is in front of the spinal cord, we tend to approach this from, from the front. Years ago, certainly in the 40s and 50s, the laminoforaminotomy or cervical foraminotomy was a very common procedure, and it's kind of faded a little bit. Not as many people do it, but there are some unique situations where it's valuable. So what is that procedure? A laminoforaminotomy is a procedure that's done from the back where you remove the pressure on the nerve from the back and maybe even get the pressure off the spinal nerve. Now, if you look at what the application for that might be, it would be when people have disc herniations that are way off on the side. There is another clinical situation where I find it useful, and that is more like an image like this, where you can see that people have a fair amount of osteophytic or bone spur disease causing pressure on the spinal nerve. Certainly this picture and this picture look very different, but the presentation clinically might be the same. Here you can see that there is some uh, uh, osteophytic disease here of something called the uncinate process, or this is what we would call uncovertebral hypertrophy. It's bone spurring from the front that is causing pressure on this nerve that leaves right here. You can also see there's some joint arthritis in the back here, and this is called facet arthropathy, which is causing pressure on the spinal nerve. And so both of those processes are causing some real squeezing of the nerve here, kind of pressure on the nerve and irritation of that nerve. The clinical situation that we call that is radiculopathy of that nerve. Similarly, you can have this big soft disc herniation causing pressure on the nerve here and similarly present with irritation or radiculopathy, even though what we're seeing structurally is very different. So what's the role of a foraminotomy? If you imagine looking at a picture like this, for example, a foraminotomy looks a little bit like this. You can go in from the back and remove part of the lamina that's this part right here. Again, this is the other native side, so you can see here, this is what it would look like normally. Here you've removed some of this, and then remove some of the bone spurs that are here. So for example, this is the other side. You can see this may have been removed over here, for example. And in doing so, you're really unroofing the spinal nerve and allowing it to drift into that space you've created. On some occasions, you can even reach around the spinal nerve and the spinal cord and pull out with the nerve hook this disc herniation. If I'm doing that, I often will do it with a microscope to be sure that you're really not manipulating the spinal cord or the spinal nerve at all, but just trying to reach around and hook this and kind of pull it out. Now, if you imagine trying to get the pressure off of it, that is something that can be a little more anxiety provoking, right? Because you're manipulating the nerve, manipulating the spinal cord. And, and often the reason that we have faded away from doing this is that oftentimes the anterior approach tends to be a more favorable and less concerning or, or anxiety provoking way of getting out this disc herniation. And there's some other considerations for it. But 
Just to illustrate what the procedure is, this would be what a laminoforaminotomy is. So a posterior cervical foraminotomy or a laminoforaminotomy allows for decompression of a single cervical nerve generally. It's usually a unilateral procedure. In other words, here you're decompressing this nerve. You could decompress this, but it really doubles the procedure. You now have to expose this side, do all the same bone work. It's exactly twice as hard to decompress both sides. So it's a procedure that is really typically, I would reserve for unilateral cervical nerve decompression. You would typically remove primarily bone spurs and kind of unroof it. You can do that very reliably, especially the stuff that's behind the spinal nerves there. Uh, and if accessible, if the disc herniation is accessible, you can sometimes reach around and pull that out as well, all through a cervical foraminotomy. And so in that sense, it is a useful procedure. What it looks like from the back when you do this procedure, you're making an incision up and down, you expose this area. Some people would do this with a tube and they actually make an incision off on the side a little bit here. But whatever approach you use, you make a window to decompress this nerve here. And you can look at it, this is looking on one side, but if you look at the mirror image, you can kind of see this is what the native bone looks like here. So you're removing part of the lamina, part of this joint to open up the foramen. And that's where the name laminoforaminotomy really comes from. You can see here you've decompressed this nerve, a little bit of the spinal cord. And if you need to, you can kind of reach in and, and kind of hook and pull out a disc herniation if that disc herniation is soft and not calcified, and if it's lateral and accessible. In other words, if the apex is lateral to where the spinal cord itself is, then sometimes that disc herniation is accessible. So this is what it looks like. Now, if you look at this picture over here, the nerve is kind of exiting this tunnel called the foramen. You're not really out of the foramen until you're past the structure called the pedicle. So if you look on this side over here, here's the pedicle, which connects kind of underneath the nerve root. This nerve is leaving the foramen, but it's not out of the foramen until it's past the pedicle. So on this picture, I kind of show these little circles here to kind of represent where the pedicle itself might be in space. And I tell people, and certainly when I'm training people, I tell them like, you have not completely done the decompression until you can feel the lateral or outside edge of the pedicle. That means you haven't gotten the nerve root fully decompressed until you felt the outside or lateral edge of that tunnel called the foramen. So that's the landmark I generally use, and that gives you a sense of how wide the, the laminotomy has to be. Now you'll notice you're taking off a little bit of the joint, but in general you have not destabilized the joint, so this is a motion-preserving procedure. Maybe one of the best motion-preserving procedures we have, because you're really not messing with the disc, you're not messing with most of it, you're just removing part of the bone and part of the ligament and a little bit of the joint to decompress that nerve root. So what's the clinical utility of this, you might ask? Well, a laminoforaminotomy allows for a decompression, usually that is unilateral. It's not to say you can't do both sides, but as I said, there's a bit of a loss of efficiency. The more levels you do, the more sides you do, the more time it adds to it. So it tends to be a one or two level, usually one-sided type of procedure in my hands. Uh, it, although it can be performed on both sides, as I mentioned. It's excellent in that it preserves motion. It allows for motion preservation. It may be one of the best motion preserving procedures that we have. It doesn't usually help with neck pain, and in my experience, just making the incision in the back of the neck, moving the muscles to the side, there's more neck pain associated with the procedure up front. Usually that subsides with time, uh, but is a valuable kind of tool to have uh, to take the pressure off of the nerves in the right patient. Uh, because you're not fusing that level, the level continues to move. People already have some degree of degeneration at that level, and people may develop recurrent stenosis or a recurrent herniation. What that means is that you've taken off a bunch of the pressure on the nerve, but maybe that disc becomes symptomatic again, or maybe the, um, the, the degeneration at that level worsens and kind of recurs, and people can develop recurrent symptoms and require surgery at that level. Those are kind of the characteristics of it. So when do I consider really using it, I would say that I use it principally when people have multi-level cervical spondylosis, so that means degeneration at multiple levels, and they really present with radiculopathy or pain into the arm attributable to one level, ideally. So that person might have, like, say, degeneration at 3, 4, 4, 5, 5, 6, 6, 7. That's quite common, but present with really a C7 radiculopathy, for example. And in that situation, I think, gosh, I don't want to do an, an anterior cervical decompression infusion at 6, 7, because then it runs the risk of it becoming this domino effect, and then you're doing C5, 6, and then C4, 5, and C3, 4. So it's really like 
in my hands, a, a great tool for somebody who's got multi-level degeneration, but really presents with nerve root irritation from one focal thing, where I think, all right, I can go in and take the pressure off the nerve and give them a chance at avoiding this sequence of fusions. And that's when I find it to be useful in the modern era. Now, it is a useful tool to learn, whether it's in a cadaver lab, if you're a trainee, learning how to do it I think is valuable because even in the setting of a fusion, knowing how to do a foraminotomy can be valuable, but as a standalone procedure in the right patient, it's incredibly powerful and valuable. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you found it informative. If you've enjoyed it, please like and subscribe. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas for future content, we'd welcome them in the comment section below.